Hey, I'm just testing my mic. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I guess when it comes time to hand it over to Gatsman, I just click change pre presenter and then um, click Lauren whenever she joins or Laura. Yes, that will allow her. She can unmute at any point, but that will allow her to share her slides if she has slides. Okay, Ashley. Um, so she's gonna be present. Uh, um, introducing Dr. Mena, right? Not you. I think you're muted, Ashley. I'll text her. Maybe she's occupied. And then, Rita, do I click? Oh, so is it being recorded, actually? I think it's actually being recorded. So whenever I, oh yeah, it is saying recording and we can cut that out um, before we post it on YouTube. Okay, like there's a way to edit after. Okay. Hey, Ashley, thanks for joining. Um, I got your text. So we were just asking um, whether you're going to be presenting or, doctor, or introducing Dr. Mena or Laura. Hey, Dr. Mena, how are you? Good, how are you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. Happy to be um, on. So so um, what's going to happen is I will do a brief announcement from the SCCM side, and I'll, okay. I'll hand it over to Laura um, from Gaspin, who will do the, your introduction, and then we'll make you the presenter. So we can kind of practice um, switching the screens. Let me see. Yeah, I just want to make sure I can uh, bring up my slides. Uh, yeah, so let, I'm going to make you the presenter, and we'll see if we can see your slides, okay? Okay. All right. Can everybody see Dr. Mena's slides? Uh, hold on. Uh, go to meeting would like record. What do I do here? It, I just need to uh, say allow. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Did, did you click allow? Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. Um, and now, there my slides. Okay. It's asking me for something else. Yeah. It's, I seem. Oh, it wants me to quit and reopen. Hold on. Okay. 
All right, I'm on. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. I I can't see the slides. Can anyone yeah, else can the find the button where it says how to share my slides? This is a different. Yeah, I can the slides. All right, okay, sure. You're the presenter. It's and then a, there is a play button that says show. Yeah. And that will allow you to share your slides from there. Okay, is that it? Yeah, I can see it now. And if I did this, you can still see it? Yes, I, we see your slides now. Right, but you see it in the slide view, right? In the presenter modes, that means you can just see my slide, not like the whole desktop. No, we see your notes too. Uh, how do I get rid of that? Um, what if you put it in slideshow mode? I um, did. Uh, maybe I have to stop sharing. Because what we are seeing right now is not the slide slideshow mode. It's just like the. Right, yeah. How do I get rid of so it? So, so right now, I have clicked slideshow on my computer, but on yours, it is still showing just the whole thing. So maybe yeah. what I think one way to do that would be if I got rid of this and I got rid of the, because I don't need my notes, because it's empty anyways, and then I did this how about that that works, that works. okay <laughs> we'll just use that then yeah yeah there must be a way to share uh, maybe i have to unshare and share again after having clicked onto the uh, presenter mode yeah we can try again do you want me to switch to myself yeah. and then switch yeah, back to you okay. okay all right so here's my screen let me see okay can you see my slide I do, yes. Even yours, I'm seeing it like mine, not in the presenter view, but I can see your uh, thumbnail on the left, uh, just like I saw mine. Okay. And then I'm going to switch to you again. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show PowerPoint and show this window. It goes back to where I was before. And when I click on my side, slideshow, it doesn't alter anything at your end. No. OK, so it doesn't even move the slides. So let me, ah, so I'll just stick to this. OK. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that works. Wow, this is fancy. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a good, uh, good system. All right, yeah. I will. Um, so this is, um, and now I'm unmute. This yeah. takes me yeah. off video, and now I'm back on. And what did this do? Okay, now not showing anything. I see what you mean. And now back. Okay, I got it. Okay, so we'll wait maybe five, ten more minutes. Hey, Ahan. Oh. Yes. I, I don't know yeah. if you guys can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Um, Laura is also having trouble um, getting on the internet, so I can do the intro if she's not able to get on. Or the, okay. you know, after you go. I'm still okay. trying to figure out why I can't hear you all, though. You can't hear us at all, Ashley? Yeah. Actually, it may be something on your end because I can hear every all the speakers well. Yeah, same here. Same here. I can't hear you all. I'll text her and let her know. Cool. Hey, Ashley, can you hear us now? She's shaking her head. No, I don't. I don't hear anything. Uh oh. We can hear you um, when you just said that. We've heard, we've heard you. Maybe you want to call in. You can start calling in. I'll text her to call oh, in. I don't know. You can't hear us. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I can try to call. Let me mute myself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, can you? I can hear you guys. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. So yeah, I can hand it over to you after my announcements if Laura still doesn't join. Sounds good. Uh, that means you'll take my slide off and show yours, right? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take uh, Tracy or mine. Yep. Yeah. Um, sure, try flipping me back on again just one last time to see if uh, it works. Change back to you? Sure. Yeah. Yep, I just did it. Um, I love it. Okay, you can have it back. Perfect. Actually, you don't have a slide, right? I do not, no. Okay. Actually, do we have a hard stop at uh, one? Um, I don't. So if we have if people questions, people wanting to ask questions, they can, right? Yeah, just yeah, in case. Absolutely, yeah. I'm happy to stay on as long as as long as we need to to ask to 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 field field the questions. Yeah. Same here. We'll start maybe around 12.03. Sure, let's see. I know we had about almost 50 people registered. It looks like we have about 10 that have joined so far. So yeah, maybe we'll give it another couple of minutes. <clears throat> And Ayhan, I noticed that we went ahead and started recording. Yeah, we talked about it. Um, well, I'll just edit it out. I'll just edit the, okay. yeah. Sure, I was going to offer. Um, so if you need help, <laughs> let me know. I'm happy to help. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, it looks like people are rolling in now.
All right, it's 12.03, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ayan Jun, and I'm the incoming president of the Southeast chapter of SCCM. Thank you for joining the meeting today. I'll make a few announcements. First, we start every meeting by stating the mission and vision of the chapter. The mission of the chapter is to secure the highest quality of care for all critically ill and injured patients in the Southeast region by providing educational and research opportunities as well as promoting multi-professional collaboration. The vision of the chapter is that all critically ill and injured persons in the Southeast region will receive care from a present integrated team of dedicated trained intensivists and critical care specialists, as well as inspire new leaders and providers of critical care in the region. Today's meeting is held jointly by the Southeast chapter and Gaspin. We're honored to have Dr. Meta as our guest speaker. The lecture today is being recorded and will be available later on on our YouTube chat channel. If you have any questions during your lecture, please utilize the chat box and we'll go over them at the end. CE is provided for this meeting. Please take a moment to scan or take a picture of this QR code on the slide. You have two weeks from today to complete the survey to obtain CE. We're excited to introduce the new chapter leadership. We'll be serving the chapter for the next two years. Please welcome our new executive officers. Some of the upcoming events from our chapters are that we have one, we have a bite sized lecture coming up on April 17th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time on the topic of alcohol withdrawal by a group of guest speakers from Baptist Memorial Health Memphis. Please look out for an advertisement and registration link. Also, please reach out to us if you're interested in participating in our future bite sized lectures. Lastly, we're excited to celebrate the National Critical Care Awareness and Recognition Month in May. If you'd like to sign up to participate in our Turn Your ICU Blue Party, please contact us via email. And with that, I would like to hand it over to um, Ashley with Gaspin. Thanks, Ahyan, and welcome, everyone. My name is Ashley DePriest. I'm a registered dietitian and um, president-elect for Gaspin. And today, I'm honored to present um, Dr. Nilesh Mehta and speaking on critical care nutrition for us. And I am representing Laura Coslo, our current Gaspin president, who was unable to make it this morning. Um, Dr. Mehta is a board-certified in pediatrics and critical care physician with formal training in pediatric nutrition and broad experience in conducting clinical and translational nutrition research. He's the, critical, he's the chair of critical care nutrition and metabolism and vice chair for quality and outcomes in the Department of Anesthesia at Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Mehta recently served as the president of American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition and has extensive experience in nutrition research, including clinical trials related to protein dosing and individualized exercise on muscle mass and function for mechanically ventilated children. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mehta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining. It's uh, a pleasure. Uh, we'll spend the next 45 minutes uh, talking about some basic concepts and controversies in critical care nutrition. Obviously, we won't have time to dive into details of all studies and, and every aspect, but let's um, uh, see what we can accomplish uh, in broad strokes. I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, I will not be discussing or endorsing any commercial products uh, during this uh, talk. The critically ill child um, is special in a variety of ways. I think uh, one of the most important um, aspect in a critically ill child is that they are not adults. Um, as you can see, uh, we come, we, we see them in a variety of sizes uh, and shapes. Um, there is an interaction between critical illness, a critically ill child, and drugs that we use that impacts not just the splanchnic circulation where absorption uh, uh, is dependent on, but also the uh, complete dependence on artificial nutrition. And finally, the metabolism in critically ill patients is, is truly uh, unique, both dynamic as well as unpredictable. So these are the reasons why we believe um, a brief foray into the metabolic aspects of critical illness might be a useful start as we explore the topic of nutrition in critical illness. What I hope to achieve is some core concepts um, and then a little bit about controversies and then I'll end with my approach, uh, an individualized approach uh, to nutrition. So let's get started with um, 
the cellular metabolism. What you see here is uh, on the left, the three common carbon-based food stuff that we consume and we utilize in order to generate energy uh, for basal cellular uh, functions and for growth. And in order for these to be metabolized, uh, one requires them to be oxidized. So oxygen is consumed, um, these foodstuffs are uh, oxidized, and as a result, there's release of carbon dioxide and water. Now, while we make energy, um, another byproduct of this is the release of some heat. Uh, and therefore, looking at this equation in front of us, we have the opportunity to correlate heat as a direct window into metabolism and a lot of experiments almost 100 years ago showed that if you are able to measure heat generation directly you would get a good sense of what metabolism is happening however uh, direct calorimetry as it is called is extremely tough uh, it's not easy for us uh, to be able to uh, put our patients in a direct calorimeter so it's obviously out of the question the other way one can peek into metabolism is to utilize the equation on the left, which is uh, try to assess carbon dioxide production and oxygen consumption. And using these gas exchange mechanisms, which are part of the metabolic equation, one can get an indirect way of assessing metabolism. And this is what is achieved with the help of indirect calorimetry or metabolic carbs which are adept at measuring minute-to-minute -minute oxygen concentrations and uh, flow volumes, giving us an indirect picture of metabolism or energy that is expended. And based once again on several experiments 100 years ago now, uh, we can extrapolate these gas exchange parameters into actual energy expended um, by an individual on a minute-to-minute -minute basis uh, in order to generate energy for basal metabolism, uh, growth, uh, heat production. So the modified weir equation is one such that we use um, and, and the indirect calorimetry is one such tool that allows us to measure metabolism and therefore get some insights into the energy requirement in a critically ill or an adult, uh, a child or an adult. This is a simplified cartoon that depicts some of the aspects of metabolic stress response. We talked about energy uh, requirement. In addition, one of the characteristics of the metabolic stress response is this central picture, the triangle, which de depicts muscle breakdown. Humans for a long time have relied on the ability to break down muscle in order to generate amino acids. These amino acids are available to humans, especially at times of stress, such as trauma, sepsis, burn, surgery, where the individual has no access to external food sources and therefore relies on the muscle breakdown from any, as an internal source of amino acids, which can then be used for protein synthesis, gluconeogenesis, uh, and, and therefore support some of the basic functions, but also try to repair the tissue that is injured. This is a fantastic stress response uh, adaptation over millennia that allowed us to survive before we learned how to produce uh, and have access to external food in, on a constant basis. Having said that though, in the modern era, the need for this muscle breakdown is now outstripped by some of the side effects of it. So while we now no longer are hunter-gatherers relying on this muscle breakdown to sustain and, and, and survive injury or illness, it continues to be a learned response that affects our patients even today. And as a result, a negative protein balance is a very common phenomenon in children or adults with critical illness. Now, if you uh, look at a variety of study methodology, here I show some using isotopes, which track protein metabolism. And these are data from ours and several other groups, which, su which are summarized in the graph on the left. The graph shows you on top uh, in healthy individuals and below that a variety of critically ill patients, sepsis, thoracic surgery, or just a general critically ill group. And what you see are in the dark black bands is the muscle uh, breakdown. Uh, in the gray bands is the muscle synthesis. And then the yellow band, which shows you the net protein uh, balance. And it's very clear to see that when you and I are in good health, 
we are in a state of a net positive protein balance or anabolism that allows us to sustain the activities and, and if we are children to grow. However, if you look at critical illness of all types, what is characteristic of these patients is summarized in the box to the right. First, there is definitely increased synthesis compared to a healthy individual who's not sick. However, there is also increased breakdown, which almost always outstrips the synthesis. And as a result, we have net negative protein balance. This has been elegantly shown in a variety of uh, methodology, whether you use uh, simple uh, observational ultrasound measures or uh, sophisticated isotope technology. However, what's the importance of this? Why is this relevant? And with uh, the last two decades where we've become adept at using bedside ultrasound to measure muscle mass, we have begun to see the impact of this stress response in critical illness on our muscle. What you see on this slide are data from uh, the United States. These are mechanically ventilated children, uh, predominantly in St. Louis, uh, Washington University uh, pediatric ICU. Uh, and you see on the graph displayed uh, on the y-axis, the percent change in muscle thickness of a variety of muscle groups, the diaphragm, biceps, tibialis, and quadriceps. And what you see is in this cohort of mechanically ventilated patients, there was a uniform uh, median loss of muscle mass, and it's across the board. In some cases, um, it goes all the way up to minus 40, minus 50% loss. This is exaggerated, of course, but in general, a 10% muscle mass loss is not unheard of. On the right, you see a representative ultrasound picture, a cross-section of a quadriceps femoris muscle, and it allows you to uh, plot out, as you can see with the dotted lines, the rectus femoris muscle uh, dimension, which, if you can imagine, can be repeated and, and loss of muscle can be documented in an objective fashion. So this is exciting uh, bedside availability that gives us some illustration of muscle loss. So why is muscle loss important? Does that actually have any impact on function? And for this, we need to go to data from burn injured patients. So on the right, if you focus on the graph, on the x-axis coming from right to left, you see a reduction in lean body mass. And in particular, in this case, they examine both healthy and burned children for their uh, leg mass, muscle mass. And as the muscle mass, and as you go from right to left, patients with lower lean body mass or lost lean body mass, um, you begin to see on the y-axis a reduction in the actual torque or the ability of the muscle, in this case, across the knee joint to conduct uh, a forceful extension of the leg. And these are measured by uh, dynamometers, which you see a picture of on the right top corner. And essentially what it illustrates that in burn, as well as patients who are healthy, muscle mass is related to function. And if you now look at your left, this depicts that in certain cases, example in burn injury, the time to recovery. So here you can see in the solid line is the muscle protein metabolism. It takes a while for it to get back to normal, but the impact of that catabolism or hypermetabolism or muscle loss is seen both in muscle mass as shown in the dashed line in the middle, and then the other dashed line in the bottom, which is muscle strength. And it takes months up to a year for you to regain the muscle strength that you've lost during critical illness. And while these are data from burn injury patients, they are exaggerated and make an illustrative point. We see this in non-burn patients, maybe at a lower uh, magnitude. And finally, the impact of this on long-term outcomes is not lost on us. In the pediatric intensive care, care world, we begin to talk about the post-intensive care syndrome. And in the post-intensive care syndrome, the physical impairments as a result of this muscle breakdown um, can be imagined, and there might be repercussions to not just physical, but functional, and eventually quality of life uh, outcomes in patients if we are not careful or if we are not paying attention to the muscle mass loss. So this is just a brief foray into some of the critical concepts of muscle and before that the cellular metabolism and why it is that we do what we do in nutrition in critical illness. 
So let's dive right in using some of these concepts uh, and address some of the controversies. We'll talk about underfeeding, overfeeding. We'll talk about strategies for muscle preservation and some nuances of nutrition delivery, both the route and the timing. So let's look at that figure once again. This is a very simplified cartoon of the elaborate stress response. And one of the major controversies that we addressed in the last three, four decades now was this well-held, uh, a very firmly believed concept that when you are sick, when a child is sick, catabolism goes up and there is an increase in energy expenditure. And it's a dramatic, it's almost like a car engine being revved and the amount of gas being consumed is elevated. And we believed this firmly until uh, 20 years ago. With the advent of indirect calorimetry, with the advent of modern medical uh, care in the pediatric intensive care units, we began to document energy expenditure in our patients. And what we realized is that truly, um, our patients are not that uh, uh, hyper-catabolic as we imagined them to be uh, just a few years ago, a couple of decades ago. In fact, um, this is still true in some of our patients like the burn injury. Once again, just like the muscle mass loss, the energy expenditure is elevated in burn injured patients. And in this figure on the left, these are data from pediatric severe burn injured patients from Galveston, Texas, which shows that you can have elevated energy expenditure in these patients up to almost nine months, 12 months. But this is unique for burn injury. When we start looking at patients in the GQ, in the non-burnt uh, populations, we begin to see a slightly different picture. The catabolism may be present, but it's not exaggerated as we imagine. And we also believe that as a result of the innate ability to generate amino acids to, to provide substrate during periods of stress, we also have endogenous energy production. So as a result of these two concepts, we began to challenge the long-held view that you need a lot of energy when you are critically ill. With the advent of uh, indirect chlorometry, as I said, we began to unravel some of these data. So on the left of this slide, you see a graph uh, from Boston Children's uh, several years ago. This is almost uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. We looked at stem cell transplant patients who we thought were severely inflamed, highly vulnerable patients. We thought nutrition was so key, and it still is. But when we started measuring their energy expenditure, uh, on the x-axis, you can see time from admission in weeks. In fact, we started seeing on the y-axis, the measured energy expenditure was lower than what we had predicted, which was the basal metabolic rate by equations. And this is a problem with equations which are developed from healthy individuals. But these sick patients had lower than expected energy expenditure. In fact, they nadir down in the first couple of weeks and never actually reach 100% of what we thought they would be, forget hypermetabolism. Same thing uh, on the graph to the right of that. With, these are data from uh, Dr. Kohanek's group in uh, Pittsburgh. And these are pediatric severe traumatic brain injury patients. And once again, on the x-axis is days after traumatic brain injury. And on the y-axis is the actual measured energy expenditure as a percentage of what was predicted. The red line is 100% prediction. And you can see the hypermetabolism was was a myth. Majority of patients were hypo. Some were very hypometabolic. As a result, the new perspective that we formed and challenged the old one is that, hang on a minute, don't pump in energy in the beginning, and certainly don't try to feed your patients 150%, 120%, but be careful. And when we started measuring these, these are some of our Boston children's data, again, quite old now, but when we systematically measured energy expenditure, we found that compared to what we prescribed based on our estimate, the actual energy expenditure, if we had used that, we would have given significantly lower energy than what we gave. And our projected overfeeding rates in some of these patients, uh, if we had ignored it calorimetry, would be epic. It's like thousands of extra calories within a small period of time in this cohort. So this is an interesting concept to remember. And yes, in your ICU right now, there is a heterogeneity of patients. And as we said right in the beginning, they all don't look exactly the same. 
So you may have some patients at risk of underfeeding because they are hypermetabolic, burn injury, or some extreme inflammation. However, a majority are at the risk of overfeeding. And unfortunately, in the absence of us having tools like indirect calorimetry or others, other tools that give us an indication of what their energy expenditure would be, you have a Goldilocks phenomenon happening right now. So that's energy. Let's move to muscle and protein. The other controversy that we face is not the question, but how do we affect some of that muscle loss that we saw, um, that we see in the isotope studies in the form of negative protein balance, that we see in the ultrasound measurements in actual measurement of muscle. Um, this uh, figure is a beautiful cartoon illustrated once again by the Galveston group, and it summarizes some of the themes at play in critical illness. On the left, you see factors that impact um, muscle mass negatively. You have immobilization. We all know from experiments in the 60s and 50s on our astronauts that if you are immobilized, if you don't have uh, passive and active uh, movement, your muscle will shrink. The neuroendocrine adaptation, which was that stress response that you show, already is putting the muscle at a loss and, and constantly defeating uh, the body's ability to maintain muscle mass. And then inflammation, which plays such a key role in exaggerating the stress response and the muscle breakdown. On the other end, there are areas which we could focus on, such as adequate protein ability. So you saw in the figure that I showed you summarizing the protein catabolism, that the body has an increased synthesis too. That means if adequate protein was available, one could make protein enough and at least try to curtail the loss that is inevitable. Secondly, physical therapy to try to counteract the immobilization. And we won't have time today to talk about pharmaconutrients and drugs, but watch that space. There are drugs out there which are being tested that might perhaps ameliorate or, or slightly modify the muscle loss. So let's talk about the nutrient delivery and in particular the prescription and delivery of protein. What this figure here shows is the nuance of nutrition. When you read a randomized controlled trial, <clears throat> you'd often find them addressing one of these. You'd have trial of a high versus low dose, an early versus late, or an EN versus PN, whereas nutrition for us on a daily basis is much more nuanced, which needs to account for all three. Um, but let's look at where we are with the optimal dose. These are some observational prospective uh, data that came out of um, one of our many international nutrition studies. Uh, for example, this was the second one that we focused mainly on protein prescription and delivery in pediatric ICUs all over the world. There were 66 ICUs involved in this and with almost 2,000 patients um, that were enrolled. Uh, these data are from 1,200 patients who received enteral nutrition. And we wanted to see how much protein is being delivered in the enteral nutrition in our ICU. So once again, on the x-axis, you see days in the ICU, day one to day 10. And on the y-axis, you see the adequacy of protein. Adequacy here means that the dietitian or the whole group together prescribed an amount X. How much of that X was actually delivered? So it's a percentage. And what you see very quickly on the graph here is that both the mean and the median barely reach even 50% of what was prescribed, uh, even by the end of one week. And the blue shaded bar uh, or that triangle is potentially, or you could postulate, is that protein deficit? And I'm not even talking about 100%, but am I missing? And on the right are crude data. On, on average, people prescribed 1.9 grams per kg per day whereas the delivery was 0.6 grams per kg per day. This is even worse in surgical patients. So these are data from 500 surgical patients from, again, a lot of pediatric ICUs all over the world. And again, the graph on the left, very similar to the previous one, this time even showing you, if you use PN in these surgical patients, you are not even reaching 20% at the end of uh, seven, day, <clears throat> seven days. And you can see the delivery on, on uh, the median delivery was 0.2 grams per kg per day, which was dramatic. And if you believe that adequate protein is important, then we have a lot of work to do. And the reason this is important is um, when you combine data from several ICUs and thousands of patients, you begin to see, as you can tell 
on the left a a very uh, gradual improvement uh, if you go from left to right or uh, worsening if you go from right to left in terms of the amount of protein adequacy delivered and the mortality of patients. So clearly uh, you benefit from improving your protein adequacy uh, so that your mortality continues to go down. And these are observational data. They are accounting for severity of illness, but they are not trial data. So having said that, the signal was too much to ignore. And as a result of such signals, there are currently trials and undergo, undertaken on high and low protein dose and the impact of strategies to improve protein delivery. Note that these were enteral protein deliveries, uh, not parenteral. Um, uh, but this brings back the concept of the nuance that when you talk about dosing, it's important to think about not just a dose, but the route and the time. So just as the protein um, signal was growing and people were becoming aware that, whoa, on one hand, we are overdoing with the energy. On the other hand, we are drastically low on protein. Um, the EPANIC trial and the PPANIC trial, the adult and the pediatric trials that focused on early versus late PN, um, submitted some of their secondary analysis. These were not the primary goals of these uh, papers, but the secondary analysis um, supplement based on the supplemental PN that was used in the early arm on both these trials seem to suggest, and I'm not sophisticated enough to explain to you what statistics they use, it was very complicated, but they seem to be convinced, and, and as am I, that in, in these data, it appeared that parenteral amino acids or protein delivered in the first 24 to 48 hours in patients in the early arm was associated with harm. The harm was in the form of infections in those trials, as you know. And the reason this was important is right around that time, the concept of autophagy was beginning to be explored. The concept of cells needing time to clean themselves and get rid of some of the byproducts which are toxic in order for longevity of the cell. And it appeared that the basic scientists were telling us that protein might impact autophagy. So this gelled beautifully. And again, a new hypothesis was generated. Say, hold on a second. Uh, actually, while we have some data suggesting protein might be essential, there are some data saying protein might be harmful. So this created and continues to create an area of controversy that hopefully in the next one or two years we will solve. As a result, what the SCTM Aspen combined guidelines, and I, and I know these are now outdated and um, the new ones are expected by the end of this year, <clears throat> suggested that if it is protein balance that you are interested in, uh, you need to give at least 1.5 grams per kg per day. But if it is clinical outcomes, we still don't have trial data to suggest what is the best protein dose that impacts or improves clinical outcomes. So these are the summary recommendations for protein in the Aspen SCCM in 2016 and the more recent SPEN guidelines that accounted for all the other secondary data. And it's essentially very similar. Aspen and SCCM believed in a much more uh, uh, broader range. Um, SPEN said you should give 1.3 grams per kg per day, but it sounds like uh, there is still an ongoing controversy, but these are numbers that people would quote. Um, and as you saw in the data that I showed, in some surgical patients, you're giving 0.2, and in most medical patients on average, they get 0.6, so not even half of what SPEN would recommend. So interesting times for protein. Now let's move on to the timing. So early versus late. And this is where the PIPANIC trial um, was focused on. So the PIPANIC trial randomized patients into early versus late. Um, I call it the trial of very early versus very late, uh, but that's just a personal bias. That's how I would uh, frame it. Um, the early arm got PN supplemented within the first 24 hours if the energy expend, uh, the energy provision by enteral nutrition was not at least 80%. So, so it's a very aggressive uh, or a fairly aggressive approach that most of us would uh, not be able to or, and do not provide. On the other arm, the other hand, uh, the, the next arm was late PN, which means they did not give PN until seven days, uh, irrespective of how much energy or protein the patients uh, received. 
but all of them got EN, all of them got IV uh, vitamins or, or minerals as a supplement <clears throat> during this trial. They found that the late PN group had uh, better uh, uh, new infection rates, um, lower new infection rates, and, uh, and got out of the unit faster. Uh, so the likelihood of discharge was uh, better. There is a lot you can talk about in these trials, and you'll find various things we've written about it. And, and like any trial, there are limitations and strengths. The most important thing is this is one of the largest trials available on timing. So it's, it's an extremely important trial to be aware of. Um, if you are a center that's providing PN on all your patients within the first 24 hours, if they don't get to 80% uh, intake by EN, you should probably stop because these are compelling data that that was not uh, a very fair strategy. However, um, a couple of points I'd like to point out. Uh, once again, um, the concept of overfeeding is important here. Uh, on the left top, uh, I show you the enteral intake, the top left corner, and these are data from the paper. And you will see in both arms, there was enough enteral nutrition that by day seven, which is when the cutoff of, early, of late PN was, a majority of patients were receiving what we have found in several studies almost 80 to 100% of what you would want to give as total energy delivery, which means that the role of early PN in these patients was probably debatable uh, in the first instance. If you now add the early PN on top of the EN that the patients in the early arm received, which is now look at the top right, and you will see the blue bars uh, where I would argue the numbers in terms of kilocalorie per kg per day, uh, as shown by multiple people, is overfeeding. So, is this a study that compared overfed versus appropriately fed? Um, is it early versus late, or is it very early versus very late? The last thing I'll say is uh, day seven is uh, is a little difficult because out of the thousand plus 1400 patients, only 25% were left on the unit at uh, day seven. So uh, it, it's a difficult construct to imagine, but the early arm, the aggressive PN, institution should be stopped based on this trial until more data are available. A more pragmatic approach was used by the adult uh, paper published in Lancet a few years uh, prior to the PIPANIC. And what they did is they, first of all, avoided overfeeding by the use of indirect calorimetry, which means the goals that they set for energy delivery were based on indirect calorimetry, and they were very careful not to overfeed. The second thing is, um, they did not wait until day seven, but around day three to day four in patients who did not reach 60% of the prudent or a measured goal, they added a supplement PN. So a very different approach, not a very aggressive, not a very delayed, but a pragmatic, my, my own terminology or interpretation of this, but a pragmatic approach. What did they find by using PN and not too early, not too late, by, but somewhere on day three, day four, it's this. They found actually uh, a lower nosocomial infection rate in patients where PN was supplemented on day three to day four, where overfeeding was uh, avoided. So this is fascinating. This, hence the controversy of optimal timing of PN continues. Um, and while we know that 24 hours is too early, and, and I assure none of us are able to do that anyways, uh, but is seven days truly the right time to wait? Um, one of the big challenges for us when we start talking about timing is this concept of when the metabolic stress response cools down, if you like, and, uh, and reaches a phase where the catabolism or the intolerance to feeding, the amount of endogenous food that is being released already is probably enough with some trophic, switches into an, an anabolic phase wherein now the body both needs but can utilize the extra nutrients. And no one knows when that switch happens in critically ill patients and each patient is different. So on the left are is that concept where should I start supplement PN or ramp up EN and if not then supplement it with PN at some point when this switch takes place and we are looking for biomarkers that will guide us in selecting the optimal timing for individual patients. Until then, it's like the gentleman on type top right driving with blindfold. I have no idea 
when I have uh, switched from uh, one speed limit to another and how to uh, cater my feeding to the patient. What we did is um, in, in our most recent uh, uh, international nutrition study, we had 1,800 mechanically ventilated patients from 77 pediatric ICUs, 17 countries. And what we decided is this construct that I showed you in the ADART trial, where patients actually achieve nutrition, were divided into those that achieve nutrient delivery goals, not just early versus late, but early, pragmatic, and late. So because the pragmatic arm is what we were more interested in. And, and what we saw is that in patients who achieved their uh, goals, and the goals in this study were just two thirds of what was prescribed, so not 80%, not 100%, so two thirds. So we were very careful in not, um, not trying to get overfed patients uh, to dilute the picture. But when you uh, look at the outcome here being 60 day mortality on the Y axis, on the X axis, you can just focus on the first um, uh, uh, first uh, uh, or the second one, uh, which shows you EN or EN plus PN total calories achieved. So on the right is the two uh, showing protein and they're identical. But if you imagine the difference in mortality, if you wait until after day seven, which is the red bar, those patients had high mortality even after adjusting for severity. But the patients who achieved their goals earlier than day seven had way lower mortality Having said that, the circle here depicts that there was no difference in mortality in the group that achieved, achieved, not started, achieved within the first three days versus those that achieved between four to seven days. So the point we made was, look, obviously there is no need to get aggressive because you're not gaining much by getting to your goal by day two, day three, especially in those sick patients, but certainly don't wait after seven days. And this was a more pragmatic, a more nuanced message and it seems to reflect what people are practicing currently, certainly what we are practicing currently in terms of when we target, when do we talk about PN. And when to summarize the, the route, we've talked a little bit about the prudence or the pragmatism of PN. Um, EN remains the preferred route in pediatric critical illness as an adult to a large extent. And in the next three slides, what I'll do is a very quick, uh, but bullet points on what I know uh, and believe about EN as best practice currently. Uh, I won't go into details uh, because this is um, something that we have bought in and we currently employ. But there are several questions about EN. When should I start? It turns out that when you look at observational studies from a variety of people all over the world, including uh, the, the number five reference, which is from Atlanta, uh, Emory, and uh, for a long time, people have shown that time to start feeds tolerated, and most people start within 12 to 24 to 48 hours. These are sick patients. And as long as the patients are not being actively resuscitated um, uh, or uh, where the focus should be on resuscitation, uh, many folks are initiating enteral nutrition early. Second, people ask me, what about the gastric versus post pyloric? Um, the, the jury is out, the trials are inconclusive, but this is what we do at Boston Children's. Um, roughly a quarter of our patients eventually land up being fed post-pyloric, 20% more like. And on the left, I've shown you the spread of what our indications are. These are this is an actual publication of our 100 patients that we prospectively uh, looked at, and we realized that we feed post-pyloric if there is a strong risk of aspiration. This might include an actual history of aspiration in a previous admission, or a constellation of factors where the team says this patient is high risk for aspiration. Or the gray bar where we've tried and failed gastric feeding, and we don't wait endlessly, um, but we do that. The third one, um, which is fairly common practice many places, is a small fraction of our non-invasively ventilated patients we resort to post -pallary. And then GI dysmotility if you feel there is a strong indication of that. So this just gives you an idea of what we do with post pyloric feeding. What many people, including us and several folks in Atlanta and others in the past have shown is there may be some ability to uh, improve delivery by post pyloric rather than waiting on gastric um, and, and, and incurring both the risk and the delays. The next question is continuous versus intermittent EN. 
Anne Marie Brown uh, at Atlanta, some amazing work, including a pilot and a large trial comparing continuous versus bolus feeding in pediatric intensive care unit. Um, in, there is an Indian group from uh, Northern India that recently published their uh, results. There's a European, and then there is another uh, review paper that summarizes all these. Um, and essentially, what it appears uh, at this point is there is no compelling evidence that one is significantly better than the other. There has not been a compelling evidence to show that we should uniformly switch from one to the other, and the jury is still out. What I'm showing you here is, again, work I did with Anne-Marie Brown and several other collaborators, is uh, uh, when we combine uh, our entry nutrition data from our international studies, we had the opportunity to look at it in an observation um, fashion, where 1,300 patients on enteral nutrition from 66 PICUs, we had a good number who received bolus feeding or intermittent feeding, and the rest received continuous enteral nutrition. And with the help, with the best of our abilities, after matching patients with propensity score, we had one to four matching, and we decided to explore if in an observational study, do you see any differences? And we didn't see difference in achieving uh, or uh, uh, nutrition uh, goals or in any outcomes, especially infections. So it sounds like there is no compelling evidence of one versus the other. The last thing I will say, which is an exciting topic uh, in, on which you'll hear more soon is, should I measure gastric residual volume? It is so um, now hot that there is a trial ongoing in the United Kingdom. I'm on the steering committee of that trial, hence I get regular updates. And the gastric PQ study is examining a strategy of using gastric residual volume to guide feeding versus no gastric residual volume. And on last account, I just heard they have 1,400 patients already enrolled. This is going to be fantastic and will answer this question one way or the other. On the left are some of our data using uh, paracetamol absorption or acetaminophen absorption tests to look at actual gastric emptying. And on the left, we show that in patients who had actual gastric emptying by using acetaminophen absorption test, some of you may know that test, um, there is no difference in gastric residual volume between those that had normal versus delayed. Similarly, there's no difference in gastric residual volume between clinically patients that advance rapidly or do not advance rapidly their enteral nutrition. So GRV is not stayed um, uh, as an evidence-based practice. It still is being measured. Many of you may have strong feelings about it. I would ask you to wait till the gastric PQ results are out. At Boston Children's, we don't believe in it as an isolated uh, marker of tolerance. Um, at the same time, we won't ignore a one liter gastric residual volume with abdominal discomfort and distension. So a pragmatic approach is what we need. In the end, I think evidence shows um, that a stepwise algorithmic approach to starting and advancing into nutrition driven or led by nursing staff at the bedside, guided by dietitians and clinicians uh, is the best approach. And I won't go into details. On the left is our data. Uh, the dashed line shows our ability to reach uh, enteral nutrition um, in terms of energy goals uh, before, and then the, the, the dark line showing after implementing a stepwise algorithm. Exactly same data from Atlanta, from uh, um, Wisconsin, from Europe. Uh, these are multiple papers that have shown that it, it's probably the prudent way to advance. Finally, in the last uh, seven minutes before we break for questions, I want to talk you through an individualized approach that I use, we use. Now, obviously, one size does not fit all, and certainly not in a pediatric ICU. Just look around you in the intensive care unit, and patients have not just different pre-illness states, nutritional states, severity of illness, ability to tolerate. So everything is needs to point towards a non-one-size-fit-all approach, a more individualized approach. You can call it precision nutrition approach. It still remains a distant goal, but let's talk about what we mean by that. What we mean is that in any individual patient, I need to account for these three. For this patient, what's my optimal dose? Do I have the tools to measure it? Do I have the evidence? In, and if neither, then can I try to uh, have an iterative approach to make sure that I'm not overdoing it? 
what's the right time and what's the safest route. I've given you some ideas on where the evidence is pointing towards it, but here's what we do. And uh, and I'm sorry, the um, in this presentation, I can use my uh, slide progression, but it, it actually is still quite easy for you to follow. So let's imagine on the x-axis is the days in the pediatric ICU and the y-axis is the energy delivery. The most important thing is to make sure that my energy goal is not setting me up for overfeeding. And that's why overfeeding on top, if I have indirect calorimetry, I will use it. If not, I would be careful about using excessive estimates, which were shown to be inaccurate. And particularly in the vulnerable adverse patients, I'll pay careful attention to prescribe a prudent goal. Once I've prescribed that prudent goal, I'm conscious in my mind of some amount of endogenous energy production. So I don't need to rush and I'm not in a rush to pump all the goal feeds right away. In fact, what we say based on our observational studies in the past that you need to just go to one two thirds of the goal in the first week. That's what's associated with better outcomes, not 100%. And then you discuss nutrition on a daily basis every day with the dietitian. Um, uh, and, and therefore the individualized approach has begun. So now the next thing I do is, I hope that we start early enteral nutrition. Remember, once you are hemodynamically stable as a patient, once resuscitation is complete. And then, as I said earlier in the previous slides, a stepwise advancement, paying careful attention to uh, validated ways of assessing tolerance, and then certainly not using GRV on its own. Now, this is the ideal scenario, a classic stepwise. And by day six, day seven, I'm up to two thirds. I don't have to worry. All's good. Uh, nutrition team can um, step away and go to the next patient. Things are going well. But this is not how it happens. What normally happens is in majority of patients, you either stay at nothing or at trophic. So imagine that's happening here in this patient. Now you introduce the concept of underfeeding. And now you're beginning to worry, OK, when should I switch my strategy? Can I just endlessly wait for trophic uh, to stay and eventually start enteral? Or do I have a role for a supplement PM? And this is the concept of do not do it very early. And we certainly don't do it very early in all patients. But at day three, you should begin to question, am I ever going to get beyond trophics? And am I at least by day seven getting beyond trophics? And if not, it is a fair game to individualize the discussion for PM. The point that we are making to try to counter some of the fear about PN is PN when used in a logical, in a pragmatic fashion with avoidance of overfeeding and with strict aseptic precautions still remains safe. And there is no evidence that it's harmful when used in a fashion that is prudent. So here's where day three to day four, certainly that by day five, uh, I would consider supplement PN because I'm not reaching my enteral nutrition goals. And then when do I stop? I don't have to wait for getting to the goal by EN, but if I'm on a steady stepwise advancement, once I get to 50%, I know the next day and the day after I'm getting there, you start talking about stopping the PN. And yes, start and stop PN for one or two days is not prudent either because you incur the risk of infection. But in most cases, by day four, day five, day six, day seven, if you are beginning to advance EN, you can stop uh, the PN. So this is just my way of illustrating a pragmatic approach to feeding. And again, it needs to be individualized to different patients. How do we individualize this? Um, the classic approach that we use is in trials. So imagine that you are conducting a trial and what trials do is uh, assume all population as a homogeneous population as seen in the left column with all everyone's blue and you are intervening and that's the treatment therapy and you expect a positive biological response that translates into a good outcome. Unfortunately, that's a very simplistic way of thinking about uh, our patients. And as a result, the majority of nutrition trials are negative. What you see is you assume homogeneity, you don't necessarily get that biological response in everyone, and then you don't see a change. On the right is a new approach, which is a more nuanced approach where you have biomarkers or assays which translate patients into endotypes. And there are three different types here in this illustration. So yes, some of the patients are indeed blue. 
who do have that biological response to your therapy and therefore have improved outcomes, but then you have the others who do not, and therefore there is no change. And if I mix all of them together, I will continue to get negative trials. And is it possible for us to go beyond and try to have trials which are enriched where we try to reasonably allocate the treatment to those where it is most likely to be beneficial. Easier said than done, but watch the space, the PQ space in particular, aware of this happening in our, uh, in our units on a daily basis, is embarking on these trials. And it won't be too long until we see biomarkers and nutrition. What I reference here is a recent article we did with the adult folks on biomarkers and nutrition. It's really fun read, and we are getting there. So one biomarker that you need to be aware of is the muscle ultrasound. And maybe in the near future, trials will start using markers like this to say, hey, my muscle is really low in this patient already. And on the current diet, I need to alter it because the muscle mass is getting lower. Who knows? I, I, I think this is coming. And the reason it's coming is because we've shown in others that there is inter-rater reliability. I can put an ultrasound probe, measure, and then you come and measure, and it's identical. It sounds like the newer protocols, the newer machine is able to accurately measure muscle mass. The last thing I will say is that nutrition is not alone, and we've treated it in isolation, but we need to think about adjunctive therapies that will uh, make it more likely for patients to see the benefits of nutrition. And particularly for muscle loss, the concept of using physical therapy with adequate nutrition is really ripe. And to that end, uh, we are currently with Johns Hopkins in the middle of a randomized controlled trial, examining the impact of both protein doses and exercise in our patients. And the results of this, uh, my colleague Sapna Kocharkar and I hope uh, to expand this to a larger trial soon. And the results of this will instruct us on combination therapies where nutrition is not in isolation, but in, uh, in its ability to combine with other logical therapies to be able to improve the outcomes. So what I hope to have achieved in the last 45 minutes is there are a lot of interesting concepts, the right upper corner, the muscle loss and the exaggerated catabolism in Burns patients, to some extent in some of our patients, on the right lower corner, our inability to pinpoint when we switch lanes from catabolism to anabolism and the need for innovative biomarkers. On the top, um, some of our common sense practices like avoid immobility, uh, if patient is able to move, yes, in some patients it may be just passive, and then wait for the answers to the protein dosing. If you have in calorimetry, try to curtail the, the dreaded overfeeding. Best mode of delivery is still enteral nutrition, and in that, a stepwise uh, nurse-driven protocol works best. Uh, watch out for the gastric residual volume probably uh, being under the spotlight once and for all. And selective PM in, a, in good hands, in a center that's conscious and is pragmatic is, is useful. And this in a nutshell is what I was hoping uh, to cover for nutrition. I'll stop here. I thank you for your attention. I have my X feed and my, and my email. I'd love to hear from any and all of you. Um, thank you all for, for listening. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Mehta. Um, I will go ahead and uh, share my sc uh, screen again, just so everyone can have the QR code. Um, but at this time, I would like to open up the floor for any questions that you may have. You're welcome to put any questions in the, in the chat box or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Again, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Dr. Mehta, thank you. This was fantastic talk. I think um, I'm, I'm personally very excited about the future of critical care nutrition. I think we've got a lot of unanswered questions, but I think we're going to have some answers to those things pretty soon. Um, one of the things I think is that a lot of us struggle with in the ICU is we often, you know, we assess a patient, we have a pretty good understanding of how we start things and, and how we estimate needs. Um, but as we go, what often happens is we say, you know, this patient needs 55 nml an hour, and that's our target, and that's where we stay, and it never moves. Um, we say we're underfeeding or overfeeding based on that one goal rate. Um, are there things that you maybe look for, or uh, obviously we may have some biomarkers in the future, or we may have some other things 
to measure exactly like indirect calorimetry, but are there other things we can look for besides just weight loss to help um, guide our calorie and protein dosing? It's a great question, uh, Ashley. Um, we, we have made some, some moves forward. So while we're waiting for some accurate and more potent biomarkers, there are things that are available to us. Uh, I'll, I'll put a few of them. One is uh, what you said is not evident uh, to everybody in our team. So if we had a better way to visually display our uh, what is going in, what was prescribed, a, a little visual cue that reminds people on where you are in your cycle, where, what state of illness are you, and what was prescribed and what was delivered. That might be one way to engage people. Uh, second thing is indirect calorimetry is getting a little better. I think newer devices are making it easier and more people are adopting it, but it is still a very, very small fraction. Um, we recently tried to look in the last 10 years, is it possible for us to get V.02 or V.CO2? Certainly V.CO2 is available in our ICUs. Unfortunately, V.CO2 is not as good as V.02 as a representative, but it is still better than the equation. So that's helpful. The third thing, this is not new, is inflammatory markers. Many folks actually seem to suggest that inflammation goes hand in hand with metabolism. And at least in some patients, simple things like CRP might indicate a switch between anabolism and catabolism. But what you said is so true that picking one number at the beginning of illness completely ignores the dynamic nature. And therefore our best ability is to um, think about where the patient is uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why in my individualized approach, the nutrition is a very integral, nutritionist is an integral part of a daily rounds. And together with the whole team, again, I don't want the dietitians to be sitting in a silo writing prescriptions. They should be part of the team where the whole picture is taken into account. Um, a patient can flip from struggling to breathe with non-invasive ventilation, having a certain amount of energy expenditure, and then intubated, sedated, muscle relaxed, having a completely different amount. So your point is well taken, but I think we do have some tools only thing that's necessary is bringing the team together for raising awareness and then talking about it on a daily basis. Thank you. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat box, so I'll read them to you. Uh, one is asking for nutrition recommendations for long-term mechanical ventilated patients. And they're asking for what type of formula does low carb benefit them in practice? What was the last part? What benefits them in practice? Low carb. Low oh, sure. carb. Yeah. What a great question. Um, again, I would start by saying that maybe uh, even in that group, I, I would vote for an individualized approach. But this is a great uh, patient group to talk about. We've done some studies where we actually went to patients' homes where they were getting home ventilated, and we altered their diet. And we published it in Journal of Pediatrics uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and what we found is that when you try to individualize even patients who are chronically mechanically ventilated, um, one of the things we did do was a lower carb. Um, uh, we actually decreased the cal cal calories, increased the protein, and we used to take our indirect calorimetry and go and measure them at home. And what we found is even with slight alterations, reduction in caloric requirement, uh, caloric delivery, we were able to decrease the V.CO2 or the CO2 production. And we thought that that would actually decrease the dependence on mechanical ventilator in some of these older patients, uh, long-term ventilated patients. The point is, uh, I think in general, if you ask me to take a guess, we overestimate the energy requirements in these. This is another group where I think the protein estimates my or protein delivery may be falling short because losing muscle, you saw my picture of the diaphragm muscle loss in some of our acutely ill patients might be even more, more important and I would try to study them. The last thing is uh, the type of formula. So I wouldn't universally say all these patients should be on a low carb diet, but it's possible that you test them like we did in our trial, That, uh, but you have some way of assessing the impact of that uh, low carb or or a certain type of diet or a low calorie or a lower calorie than you initially were giving. Um, my worry is that each patient might be different. There's also the whole obese population with chronic illness on mechanical ventilator where you have no clue what their underlying malnutrition is. So I, I'm, I know I'm not giving an answer which is straightforward to this question, but this is an important patient group where perhaps we have overdone calories, underdone protein, 
and we need to try to be iterative and assess the response to our therapy. In this case, again, you know, weighing them would be important. Are they just gaining weight uh, on chronic mechanical ventilation should trigger something uh, and probably prompt you to readdress their um, intake, uh, if you like. Thank you for that. And we have a couple more questions. One is, is there any role for trending pre albumin slash CRP as a way to trend nutritional status? Do any other labs play a role here? It's a great question. Uh, I think CRP for sure. Um, pre albumin people are still trending. I, I, I have colleagues in parts of the world where this is trend and then people take ratios uh, uh, as well to try to come up with an idea. I think in the absence of using these uniformly to drive major changes um, because that's not evidence-based and we haven't done those trials i do believe that i gain some insights from the trending i certainly believe that if you are headed in a certain direction with both your pre-albumin or crp it gives me an indicator and it might add to my understanding of the shifting lanes as i was talking about um, we do look at crp here pre-albumin unfortunately because it's an acute phase reactant and because it also goes along with inflammation um, is a criticism that you may be able you may be misled if you use it alone but i think together they have a role i couldn't tell you what i do with it in an evidence-based fashion but the trends are really important and the only way we'll find out is if we measure these more and then based on observations make hypotheses and then use them in trials other other labs um, we're not using a lot of other labs. Unfortunately, the biomarker space is uh, still up in the air, partly because some of those um, labs are not easily routinely available. Um, so we currently don't have anything else that we are using. All right, thank you. Another person asked, when you say NIV, non-invasive ventilator, does, does this include high flow nasal cannula? We used to do only post pyloric feeds for BiPAP and high flow, but lately we're trending my attending. Yeah, I think this is a little subjective. People will say I had a patient just last week who was an infant on 14, because we have all these high flow of, um, uh, pathways where you go to two per kilo and up to 14 and 20 liters per minute. And in those patients, someone would ask, should I be considering post pyloric? I wouldn't argue. We don't routinely feed them post pyloric. That would be the answer. But in some patients, if if a constellation of things where it's really high flow, where you're almost in an infant giving uh, or NIV type of pressures, uh, then it makes sense not to fill their stomach up with large amount of volume. But we don't routinely feed our uh, high flow patients post pyloric. Thank you for that. Um, another person asked, what are the main medications that decrease muscle mass? Well, it's a great question. I think the, the, the most important thing that we know is that um, anything that increases your catabolism or inflammation will be um, uh, related to muscle loss. So I don't think um, medications that increase muscle loss, but there are several medications that are being tested that seem to ameliorate or cut down muscle loss and inflammation and stress response. And these are studies done in burns patients and, and believe it or not, they include uh, anabolic hormones like growth hormone and even uh, uh, beta blockers. These are being tested as we speak to decrease their uh, impact on the stress response and inflammation and therefore improve muscle mass or decrease the breakdown. I think this is the last question. When looking at the data you show that have increased mortality when starting feeds after seven days, was it looked into why the patient wasn't starting on NRL nutrition? Was the patient too sick or too unstable? It's a good question. Uh, these are observational trials, so I would take that uh, as a caveat. These are not randomized controlled trials. So these were just observations, and it's impossible in an observation trial to, and this is the, the problem with observation uh, studies, to try to get into people's heads as to why didn't you start. Uh, so we don't have that level of uh, interpretation of why. One of the common reasons people don't start is patients are too sick. And uh, we try to use uh, indirect ways of accounting for health uh, of sickness severity, uh, but that's not enough. Uh, one point I would make is that those uh, greater than seven days uh, were both EN and PN combined as well. So 
So it, it turns out that if you wait that long, there is a signal. And just like any signal, we should test this in a trial. What I believe we should do next is uh, the Pepanic trial was great, very early versus late, but maybe the next trial would include a pragmatic arm to try to address what do I do during that entire week? That's what everybody is asking. I have zero enteral nutrition. I have a malnourished patient. Is that someone I should just walk away? The Pepanic suggested that. I don't think it was designed to answer that question. So, so the, the point from our observational uh, uh, data should prompt us to say, now I need to test this pragmatic uh, approach. Yeah. Ayhan, I have one more question, if it's OK. Please, Ashley, yes. Yeah, you mentioned um, the, the concept of, of the metabolic heterogeneity of our population. Yeah. So would you be willing to speculate on what types of things we might be looking at in terms of heterogeneity and in, in the, in the metabolism or metabolomics of our patients that, that we may see? So is it things like obesity or is it some other genetic component that we don't even know about? What a great question. Um, three to four things. The, one, the first thing that as dietitians and nutritionists, we almost immediately think about is the pre-illness state, nutritional state. So I think um, one of the screening parameters that people have started using is that if I have a severely critically ill patient, is that who I want to uh, target because they are also severely malnourished because I may get maximum bang for my buck. That's number one. So nutritional screening parameters. Uh, the second one, you're absolutely right. There are genetic markers that indicate metabolic processes. And if you read our biomarker paper, there are a lot of such potential um, candidate markers out there that people might combine together to almost give you like a barcode to say your genetic predisposition or your ability to catabolize. So that will be much more in the distant future, but the nutritional screening is easy. The third area is probably inflammation and that's where all the money is. So even something simple like CRP, uh, do I want to target patients who are inflamed or do I want to target my delivery only after the inflammation has subsided because I believe that they are catabolic then. So, so inflammation is number three. And the last one is probably metabolism. For example, in protein, I might be able to check the urine or some tracer studies to say, this person has significant protein losses and I want to address that, whatever my intervention would be. So opening up a window into metabolism, that could be one biomarker, opening up a window into inflammation, having genetic and then nutritional. And lastly, while we are waiting for all this, you can then use some of these to even change course during a trial. So you can say, and that's the enrichment trial where you 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 start, but then you drop some patients out and then uh, you have a more enriched population. And you know, ultrasound would be up there as well. Um, you know, diaphragm ultrasounds and stuff, who knows? Uh, yeah. But it's an exciting point, Ashley. I, I really believe we are, in our lifetime, we'll be doing those trials. I'm quite confident. Sounds like a nice use for AI. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Thank you, Ahan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for your um, lecture and your answers to our questions. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. At this time, if there's no more questions, we'll conclude the meeting. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate thank everybody you. joining. Bye. Talk soon. Bye-bye.